All right, so thank you so much for joining us today on the session. And the topic we are discussing is it's a very crucial uh, mental health, the challenges and the technology. We already have the host and the panelists uh, joined us. So before we move ahead, uh, just request you to just uh, make sure that uh, you are connected to the audio set mode. Okay, you have a proper speakers on. Okay? And if you're not able to hear us, just uh, if required, just dial in with the phone okay? so you can hear properly and uh, take the notes from the session and make most of it. Right. So I would love to uh, introduce you to the host of the session. So uh, Prashant, welcome to the session. So today's host will be Prashant Khambekar. And uh, he works as the senior VP with Harminger Systems. He has more than 20 years of industry experience in engineering and management. Uh, he's based out of the US in Philadelphia. Prashant has done PhD in computer science and he has been like, I would say, uh, a technocrat along with uh, managing the sales and delivery. Uh, he also has uh, expertise in blockchain and other technical areas as well in machine learning and AI as well. So that's that was short about uh, Prashant. I'm sorry if I have missed something. You can definitely add to it. And it's been more than I guess 15 years he has been working with Harbinger Systems and managing delivery earlier and now sales functions and the healthcare business. So Prashant, over to you. All right. Thank you, Ganesh. All right. So it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you all to be uh, to the webinar today. Uh, we are joined by our distinguished panelists, and I'll do a brief introduction and turn it over to them so that they can uh, talk a bit more about uh, themselves. Uh, so uh, we are joined by Kavi Misri. Uh, he is the, the co-founder and the CEO of Rose Health. Uh, so you know uh, he is currently based in New York, and uh, you know he will tell us a little bit about. Uh, his background and uh, and uh, about Rose Health. Over to you, Kavi. Hey, Kavi. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Kavi. Um, I'm as mentioned, I'm a CEO and founder of Rose Health. Uh, Rose Health is a digital mental health platform. Um, uh, my background is in healthcare investments. I uh, worked as a healthcare M&A investment banker for J.P. Morgan and SunTrust, and then after working the 80 to 100 hour work weeks for uh, seven years, I burned out. And uh, at that point, I experienced mental health care for the first time and was just blown away by the inefficiencies and not just accessing care, but purely navigating the mental health ecosystem as a whole. So decided to do something about it, leverage my experience as an investor, as an entrepreneur, but most importantly as a patient to build Rose to what it is today. And Rose is an acronym for recognition of recognition of speech and emotion. So what we do is we leverage deep tech for early detection of depression and mood dis and, and mood disorder symptoms. The problem we're facing, uh, or the problem that we're solving, is that 85% of all mental health care in the U.S. is being treated by PCPs. Yet only 10% of these PCPs feel equipped to treat these patients. And our solution leverages that deep tech to identify and predict depression and anxiety. And then we close the gap by triaging the, pa the patient and equipping the PCP with the differential clinical pathways to reduce waste and increase revenue. Um, our impact is really based through our clinical validation of phase one IRB study results that show improvements in patient outcomes, improvement of anxiety and depression by about 70% 70, 70 and Providers can really augment care by identifying at-risk patients prior to decompensation. Uh, what makes us different is really our deep tech, our deep tech approach, uh, leveraging natural language processing for text-based and uh, text-based analysis as well as for speech and audio, which allows us to identify and predict patients who may be risk based on picking up semantic tones. And we are rooted from Johns Hopkins. So we leverage an evidence-based approach for our care pathways. And lastly, we sit on the left side of the funnel and care 
when it comes to mental health care, given the fragmented industry. We do the early detection, we do short-term therapy, and then we would pass the patient along to a long-term therapist. Great. Uh, we are joined by Charles. Uh, so Charles is the president of uh, Backbone uh, Incorporated. Uh, he's also the co-founder of uh, Embark. And as part of Embark, he has the PQuest product. So Charles, uh, could you uh, talk to us about that a little bit? Of course. Uh, thanks, Prashant. Uh, thanks, Ganesh. And thanks to the Harbinger team for having me join this uh, panel. It's obviously a very timely and important uh, topic. So delighted to be participating in this with my two panelists. Uh, yes, I'm president and founder of Backbone, uh, providers of marketing and business development services to healthcare and HR technology companies since 1996. And uh, yes, Prashant, as you mentioned, I'm co-founder of Embark, uh, developers of tech-driven tools to help all segments of the mobile workforce, people from going from the main to the home office, expats and impats, um, successfully transition to their new location, culture and situation. And uh, you mentioned PQuest, P-E-A-Q-U-E-S-T. Uh, it's an immersive platform um, to assess how well people uh, have made that transition or how capable they are to make uh, that transition. And in my limited spare time, uh, I'm the co-host and producer of uh, World at Work's Work in Progress uh, podcast, where I speak with um, CEOs, analysts, and a range of total rewards-related issues, including motivation, recognition, compensation, and of course, wellness. Uh, and I'm also the host of the EAPA podcast sponsored by the Employee Assistance Professionals Association, where I speak with top EA and mental health professionals, as well as vendors uh, and end users. So I come at this uh, topic from a, a biz dev and marketing perspective and in my work uh, with Embark as a developer of mental health and wellness support technology. So I'm looking forward to uh, having this conversation. Great, Charles. And uh, we are joined by Constantine. Uh, so Con uh, Constantine uh, comes to us from Luxembourg and uh, he is the founder of CCS International. Uh, which helps uh, people with uh, all kinds of issues. And he's also uh, associated with the Association of European Businessmen, uh, business people. And uh, essentially he heads uh, some of their uh, committees. And so Constantine, will you please tell us about that? Yes, uh, well, thank you, first of all, to um, um, Harina for giving us this opportunity of the panel and uh, sending the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you and the other panelists. Um, my background is uh, I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, really, and I started CCS, uh, Corporate Counseling Services, um, about 30 years ago, 32 years ago, actually, um, uh, providing mental health and, um, um, well, um, health management uh, for businesses, primarily in Europe. Um, in the late 90s, I was a board member of the EAPA um, in the United States. Um, helping them to grow a little bit more international. In the meantime, that um, has very much happened. And EAP is really very much a global kind of approach, helping enterprises to embrace basically uh, the mental health needs and other things um, of the workforce um, in, in, in virtually all corners of the world. Um, our CCS operation is currently active in, in a bit less than 50 countries um, of Europe, Middle East, and, um, and, and further. And uh, well, my interest in this whole area here is not only to provide um, actually um, services and quality services based on my own clinical experience, um, and things like that, but um, also to um, really sort of, well, be on the bandwagon of all the new trends, the digitalization procedures and things that keep happening around the world. And um, that's, I think, also the driver uh, why I'm here in this discussion here today, um, because while well, we have great interest and, and, and some developments indeed in this area, um, as other panelists have already pointed out. So to keep it short, um, happy to, be here and look forward to the discussion that we will have in a minute. All right, great. So uh, we can jump in. Uh, you know, uh, the, the I think uh, you know uh, we 
kind of know in general terms that uh, mental health is growing in importance. Uh, but I think a lot of people don't understand how uh, important uh, and vast the problem is and how many people it affects. Uh, so uh, here are some, uh, some statistics that uh, basically uh, over 20% of all Americans uh, meet the criteria of having some kind of, uh, you know, mental disturbance, mental illness, mental inability. Uh, basically, we are talking about, you know, what is what is the, you know, what is a normal person or what is uh, might be considered to be a person who is quite enough able to handle things. Uh, we all suffer from anxieties and, you know, uh, some disturbances and so on. But it is that ability to, you know, get back and function uh, properly in the in the in the workplace in our in our family situations that is uh, that is crucial and so you know when uh, that kind of like uh, uh, goes away or becomes less than desirable then we have uh, uh, issues uh, similarly you know uh, one in 25 american uh, lives with some sort of uh, uh, um, uh, an illness problem uh, in terms of like uh, you know, the, there are a variety of uh, ways in which uh, it affects different people differently. Uh, women are more likely to suffer from uh, uh, mental illness more than uh, men, and it probably affects them also at a, at a deeper level. On the other hand, uh, we see that, uh, you know, uh, men see in depression or any type of like admitting that they have uh, a mental illness, uh, they think of it as a sign of a weakness, you know, and they do not want to uh, to admit it. Uh, so we have like this, uh, you know, multiple things. We, first of all, we have a, a, a big problem and that problem needs to be addressed. And as our panelists indicated that they have uh, come up with like different ways of like looking at the problem. Uh, so we have that problem and it is kind of like wide ranging and it's also uh, kind of like uh, has a variety. Uh, it is uh, it is uh, segmented. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so uh, you know the, the my first question uh, can I maybe I can start with uh, uh, with Charles is uh, does mental health get uh, the attention that it should get? Um, it's getting more attention, uh, but not nearly as much as we need it to get, as some of the statistics you cite indicate, um, you read uh, articles and many people refer to the quote unquote mental health crisis. Um, you know, the good news, um, I guess, you know, uh, the good news is sort of the same as the bad news in a sense, you know, the pandemic um, has caused a spike in anxiety and depression and a whole range of counterproductive behaviors, but at the same time, it has really put a spotlight on mental health. And you know, obviously we're talking about mental health within the context of the organization and, and the workplace. You know, uh, and within that context, it's really been a great leveler has the pandemic uh, been in that it, uh, you know, it affects everyone at all levels in an organization. No one is exempt, more people in leadership, positions have experienced issues themselves or seen these issues up close among family members and colleagues, you know, which is, prompted them to take a more active role in raising awareness of mental health challenges and providing support and resources to make sure they're not impediments uh, to, to productivity. But of course, mental health has long uh, struggled with the overarching uh, stigma, which obviously prevents people from reaching out to get the support uh, they need. And of course, there are gaps in care, uh, gaps in access to appropriate personalized treatment and the dearth of available uh, ex ex experts. And I know we're going to get to that. Uh, in a moment which widens those gaps and limits how many people actually get uh, the help and guidance they need. But also um, there are some positive developments in the broader culture where uh, we're seeing people like Naomi Osaka, the tennis player, Simone Biles, the gymnast, Michael Phelps, the swimmer, Kevin Love, the basketball player. You know, if elite athletes are grappling with these problems, we can all have these problems. There's no shame, which tends to lower the stigma. So you know, again, the, the, the pandemic has caused a spike in some of these um, conditions and behaviors, but at the same time has uh, put more uh, of a spotlight. So to answer your question in some, uh, it's getting more attention, but not nearly enough. 
Constantine, uh, what is your view? Maybe just a few points to add what Charles just said. Um, um, I think, uh, well, it's obviously true, and you showed it also in your little uh, slide thing. Um, there is a high level of people who, at some point in their adult life, uh, do suffer from some from some condition of mental health, uh, well, um, issues. Uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, has studied that, published that long time ago. This level of recognition and the shame factor are clearly points of, of interest and of importance. Uh, and when Kavi will talk more about um, his particular sort of approaches, we will also see there is something that I think is really, really important. And that is we have to look at the different age groups um, in this uh, domain in the sense that, uh, well, um, there's a lot of younger people uh, who, and specifically also with the COVID situation, do have um, experiences of states of anxiety and panic attacks and all sorts of early signs of mental health issues that make them feel unwell, um, where they are not necessarily getting the level of attention and support that they would need. Um, and that's where we come to talk more about technology. So um, I think there will be a significant edge um, in that, um, in reaching out also to that kind of particular audience. Um, that doesn't leave the others um, out of um, any sort of, um, well, attention that they should get. Um, but the older generation people often have more of a tendency to try and seek attention from established sources. And what Charles emphasized is that there is not barely enough of those resources really available. That's not just a US phenomenon, but I can support that from my more international experience uh, that we do have indeed quite a lot of well, gaps at that level. Um, but um, as Charles emphasized, the COVID situation has brought uh, this into the limelight and, and um, there is much more attention these days um, in terms of discussions around public health technologies and, and policy developments um, that is driving, um, well, um, changes and hopefully for some better. So, uh, Kavi, uh, like, uh, you know, your experience with regards to like uh, primary uh, care versus, uh, you know, secondary care. So are there enough doctors uh, or, you know, in general, I mean, let's not talk about software, we'll come to software uh, in a bit, uh, but what is the ecosystem? What is the current, uh, you know, uh, situation from the viewpoint of the patients? Sure. So currently the status quo of mental health care is broken. It's, some, it's one of the sub-industries of healthcare that has just suffered over the past decades. And as a result of that, we do not have the bodies that are needed to treat those that are in need of care. Um, what we're seeing is that a, a, a majority of the mental health care, a majority of mental health care is actually being done in the primary care setting. About 85% of all mental health care is done in the PCP office and the primary care physician office. Yet less than 10% of these physicians actually feel like they have the acumen or the resources. Granted, they've taken like two classes in, in med school um, and they don't feel comfortable with treating their patients. However, about 75% of all antidepressants are actually prescribed in the primary care setting. So wow. that really tells a very interesting and beautiful story that these primary care clinicians are the first and only line of defense when it comes to treating their patients. They have to do something about it. And the only thing they can do is really provide a prescription. And what that shows is that it will, it will come to a point where there's great, there'll be patients who would fill the prescription and take the prescription, but not having that talk therapy to be able to handle the, uh, the other side of, of what's needed to make the medication work and to do actual talk therapy. Um, the clinician will also tell the patient to call the back of the insurance card. And at that point, that's where they would, they would have to spend an hour or so over the phone and just, and then get about 20 names that they'd have to cold call and cold email 
in order to get an actual therapist. Now that for someone that's going through some sort of mental health uh, uh, decompensation, that's just not what you're going to do. That's the last thing you want to do. The last thing you want to do is actually get out of bed. So what we end up seeing is that 80% of those who experience mental health care, they actually drop out of the system. And that obviously leads to, uh, it leads to driving waste in the healthcare system as they continue to, uh, with their decompensation. And also actually one, a couple more points when we look at the, stati the, the statistics, it shows that about 100,000 mental health care clinicians are needed right now to treat the current demand of those who need help. And by 2025, there'll be a need of 225,000 um, clinicians in order to treat the mental health concerns. And as we will talk more about this as the questions come, but there, this is a problem that we just cannot throw bodies at because there are no bodies to throw to solve the problem. Well, wow. okay. Yeah, you know, I just well, like to interject. I think Kavi made a please. really interesting uh, point, if I might, uh, where he says that, um, you know, somebody's going through maybe suicide ideation or just is uh, deeply depressed. Um, they're not going to get uh, out of bed. Um, some years ago, uh, I was engaged uh, by a group, actually by the Tennessee National Guard. What they wanted to do was develop a suicide prevention app. And there were some very specific issues with uh, National Guard's members, uh, not just Tennessee Guard members, obviously, uh, all, all locations across the country. And then as we did our research, we realized, you know, um, th there's no really such thing as a suicide a prevention app because it really doesn't address the reality of the situation. Um, somebody is going through deep anxiety or suicidal uh, ideation. They're not going to go to the app store. They're going to have, as Kavi says, problems perhaps getting out of bed or the problems are not necessarily that, that the, the, the problems actually before, you know, they go through that kind of ideation. And Kavi mentioned that uh, mental health care uh, is broken. And it's broken in so many ways, and I'm sure we'll get into it. And 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 fundamentally, where it's broken, uh, yeah, there aren't enough bodies. But even on the uh, tech side, where they're sort of trying to compensate for that by providing these, you know, user-driven tools, uh, a lot of these tools. And again, I know we're going to get to that. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. A lot of these uh, tools are developed by uh, technology people. They're not necessarily an overwhelming number of them are not you know, uh, evidence-based. So there is a disconnect. They're not really understanding the dynamic, uh, the behavior of somebody who's going through depression or is anxious or is going through suicidal uh, ideation. So that's just a, a real element of where, you know, this system is broken. I just wanted to jump in because, you know, uh, Kyle yeah. painted a really interesting picture. Really yeah. And, and to uh, your point, Charles, um, yeah, as far as with Rose, we are actually the solution that's solving that problem that you just stated. We are able to predict using uh, AI as well as a deep tech approach and be in a position where we can get the, get the patient to the right person at the right time with the right level of care. Um, so excited to share more about that as we continue. All right, yeah. Uh, so I think that's a, a good point. Like Constantine, uh, yeah. you know, uh, at some point there is uh, kind of like mental wellness and then there is like mental illness. Uh, so, you know, uh, what is your experience and what uh, do you see over there? Yeah, well, two things. Um, I will I will talk about this in just one second, but just wanted to add maybe to that previous point of discussion, one element more. It is not just a doctor's issue here. Um, the mental health professionals are not just medically trained and educated people. We still have, uh, the, well, APA, uh, American Psychological Association, that regroups the interests and uh, um, houses the, well, the professional interests of, of uh, clinical psychologists. 
um, in the world of employee assistance, which a lot of enterprises in the United States do employ, uh, the largest majority of the counselors uh, working there are educated uh, clinical social workers. Uh, all of these people do have experience and an education and often much more than the doctors um, in their uh, formal training procedures um, in, in really understanding and knowing more about behavioral health and, and mental health uh, type issues. Uh, and when they have a therapeutic um, education, uh, then they are also more equipped indeed to deal with people um, confronting ailments as were described. Now, when we come to the point of wellness um, uh, versus um, treatment of illness, uh, we are really exactly at that same crossroad. Um, the wellness component, or we often talk also more about the well-being, uh, the mental well-being of an individual, um, has a bit of a preventative component in the sense that um, there are all sorts of things that people can be educated in doing in a better way to maintain a certain balance in their life and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we talk about um, uh, mental illness, uh, we are really talking about people who are in a process of disease. Um, and who do have needs of, of uh, proper treatment. And indeed, I would uh, certainly concede to what Gavi was, Gavi was saying. Um, um, there we very often do need, uh, well, people who have a background in psychiatry, um, uh, who are medically trained in that field, um, and who can potentially, um, as needed, uh, prescribe appropriate forms of medication as, 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 as do exist. Uh, but that's not the solution to the majority of people. The very largest number of people, even confronting what we call mental illness, um, do need other forms of treatment and can be helped in all sorts of different ways. And when we come to discuss a bit more about the technologies um, that are out there, uh, I'm sure that we will see that there is a lot um, in the pipeline at the moment um, that can help uh, to emphasize exactly um, this particular point. So let's see how we look at that. And well, maybe one more point. Uh, mental illness is really defined very much by the DSM-5 uh, for those who like technology, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that has been drafted in various versions. We are now at version five uh, by the um, American Psychiatric Association. Um, and that is the Bible, the nosology uh, that enlists all the different forms of mental illnesses that people can encounter. Um, and, and gives guidelines for treatment approaches, diagnostic differentiation and whatever. So that's, that's maybe also important to have in the back of our minds when we discuss this. Kavi, what else would be like uh, relevant here? Like, uh, you know, uh, is there a differentiation with regards to like uh, age of people? I see that somebody just uh, popped a question about like very young children or something. Uh, you know, uh, so very young children, teenagers, uh, uh, you know, people in the prime of their life, seniors, you know, yeah. uh, is there any, is that significant or is there like the gender divide that is significant or is there uh, something else like uh, career orientation versus uh, personal orientation? Yeah. What, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. So what we're seeing now is that the prevalence of, of child and adolescents who are experiencing mental, mental health concerns are pretty significant. It's actually a very sad thing to think about that a majority of the adolescents who are spending days in the emergency room because there just aren't enough beds or we never planned for beds for adolescents. Granted, we don't even have enough beds for adults. So what we're seeing is a lot of decompensation on further decompensation with, with children uh, and adolescents. Um, and then also we're taking these children and adolescents out of their element from being able to socialize and being able to um, be with uh, and grow up as, as, uh, as we all did and, um, and be able to achieve things as we, as we grow. One of the other items is, is more along the lines of uh, the, the functional adult versus the non-functional adult. So the functional adult is obviously more apt in being able to have an improvement in their mental health care. Um, and, and those are typically the functional adults. So 
the working functional adult that experiences mild to moderate anxiety, depression, trauma, ADHD. Those are the people and those are the, the popu- that's the population that we can actually work with and change and improve their, their level of mental health care um, within a five week period. And we've proven that through our clinic, our, our phase one RB clinical studies. Um, as we look at geriatrics, that's also a very interesting population. Um, we see that loneliness, social isolation, um, SDOH has always is, is a major impact, a major player in the geriatric population. And, and having someone to talk to, whether that's someone on the other side of an app or being able to do a meditation session and being able to join in every Wednesday, for example, at 4 p.m., where you have the opportunities to speak with someone, that gives you that gives the geriatric population a, a high chance of really feeling like they're less alone and less socially isolated. Hmm. Maybe one more point okay. to add to what we are what we're saying here uh, in the beginning. Um, I mean, between the, the, the well-being and the wellness and the mental illness, um, there is sort of a continuum in the sense that, well, um, if everything goes really well, you have your serenity, you have your balance, uh, things are under control, you have different things that really, um, well, are, are in the right place. Um, and, and as Kavi is saying, I mean, um, isolation, uh, work pressures, experiences of excessive stress, uh, the COVID situation that has brought on um, all these different things, um, well, shifts people along the lines of, of this continuum in the sense that they go from uh, well, being in control and, and, and having having things are really lined up in the proper way because they have social connections and whatever um, towards a position where uh, the communication about how they really feel and what's going on um, is, is, is gradually fading away. Um, but it's a behavioral thing also in the very first place. And only when people end up in more severe kind of conditions, um, the, the, the more medical side of things, um, i.e. the treatment through, through pharmacological means and whatever else really comes into play. And in the meantime, as Kavi is also saying, the very largest majority of people who have forms of mental health issues without really mentally fully being diseased, maybe, um, they can be treated and can be supported by, by all, all these technical kind of things that we will talk about in a while. You know, if I could just make a, 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 yeah, a, 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 a add to that to this whole uh, segmentation uh, idea, um, you know, I mentioned the work um, briefly that we're doing with uh, Embark and our PQuest uh, platform is about supporting all segments of the mobile workforce, uh, people who are making a transition from going from a main office to a home office, uh, expats, we even impacts uh, our, our processes coming up with sort of a, what we're calling um, sort of the um, unified uh, theory of mobility to the extent that while uh, on the surface, these different segments are dealing with different things, they're fundamentally uh, dealing with many of the same problems as in making the transition to a new culture, a new situation, new location. Um, so uh, again, we're, we're talking about this segment of uh, the workforce and dealing with you know, um, their agility, which is to say their uh, emotional, mental agility, their ability to master a situation, even master their own emotions and their capacity for uh, professional and personal growth. So uh, again, you know, we're just talking about different segments of uh, the workforce, the population, each having a different set of problems. You know, we're focusing on those uh, uh, as they relate to the uh, so-called mobile workforce, which is, as we know, uh, becoming a uh, bigger and bigger segment uh, of the yeah. workforce with, with its own set of uh, challenges and its own set of uh, mental health issues. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. important point. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, skip one thing, but let me now jump into the uh, the software side. Uh, so you know, uh, all of you have uh, uh, you know experience with like what would be appropriate to to handle this situation. Uh, so you know, uh, can I start with uh, Constantine? You 
and you can uh, talk a little bit about like what uh, would be like you know desirable in software and technology in, in order to try to address some of these uh, things that we just talked yeah well i think one one of the the key and great advantages that we have these days is that we have so much more access to to actually data so we have uh, we have a, a wealth of data that is out there uh, the analytics that we apply these days uh, to such data, developing um, um, intelligent algorithms, um, using artificial intelligence, developing self-learning um, um, instruments and whatever. I mean, all these things are very much out there and they are, they are very much front end, if you like, developments. And that's great. Um, from a professional point of view, uh, for, for the treatment community, uh, therapists, counselors, uh, medical professionals, whatever, um, a lot of these technologies are great support instruments indeed um, for um, early classification, diagnostic kind of um, separation, identification of things. Um, and and they, they work great also for the clients, patients, if you like, um, in the sense that uh, with all these different tools that are out there and available, um, um, it becomes much easier to address things and also to maybe as we were talking about the shaming and, and, and those kind of elements uh, for people really just to recognize that what they are going through is, is not totally abnormal or, or out of scale. Um, and it's okay to address that by, by, by while well, filling in such questionnaire type things. And they are becoming more and more digital and indeed these things they're not in the old traditional way paper and pencil kind of things um, and the combination indeed of, of all the data um, and pooling things and whatever uh, creates a huge amount of opportunities and i'm sure that kavi has much more to say about all of that yeah uh, but what about the uh, aspect constantine about like the you know the reluctance of, uh, of patients to open up uh, does the does uh, software or maybe not not being directly in front of the uh, the you know the doctor is that is that uh, alleviated by software or or is that like made worse by software well i think um, we talked a very little bit about um, age groups and, and and different levels of people sure enough uh, the older generation people might have more difficulties embracing such new tools and different approaches for sure because they're not so familiar with the, uh, well the use of such things where the younger generation people on the contrary are very um, more engaged with such things. Um, they don't like to pick up the telephone and start talking about themselves, uh, but they like to maybe have an app function or something that questions them, that gives them cues, um, allows them to interact with the system there um, and, and to basically get deeper into what their real issues are. And if such systems are intelligent enough and well designed, um, they, they do indeed create a lot of opportunities. But Charles made that point earlier on. Um, it's very, very important that uh, we are not overly intrigued by just the wealth of all these things that are out there, uh, but to focus really on the ones who are really evidence-based and well-researched tools, um, because that uh, makes the difference. And Charles, to just jump the point there. Yeah. Yeah, go Sorry, ahead. Go ahead. Okay. yeah, no, I just wanted to drop a point there about your question. Um, what we're seeing as well is that men, specifically black men, are more uh, are more apt in experiencing some sort of therapy at this point because they are not in front of a person. Um, there was actually a study done in uh, 2018 in China, which showed that a significant amount of people Pre preferred using uh, an avatar, creating an avatar of themselves, and then being able to represent and talk to the clinician or to the therapist as that avatar, because there was almost like a wall there. And we're seeing that right now with black, brown, um, Asian cultures where it, that it really is the case that being able to hide behind, not necessarily hide behind, but being able to have a discreet conversation allows them to lower that stigma, stigma, break that stigma, and actually get the help that they need. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Kavi, I'm so glad you said that because I was going to make that very point. That's uh, that, that's uh, the only thing I'd add to that, and and it sort of goes back to the comment I made about when uh, I was approached, my group was approached by the Tennessee National Guard to develop the suicide prevention app. And, you know, after doing some research, I realized that really it's a little too late. Uh, first of all, it's unrealistic for somebody to all of a sudden go to an app store and, and look for that, but it's really kind of too late. You got to get uh, people a little bit earlier. And it kind of goes to, you know, wellness before, you know, an issue crops up. You want to, to the extent that you can, uh, change behavior. So, you know, the challenge with a lot of these uh, apps is, at, you know, when you're engaging uh, people, because it kind of can be on certain, in certain instances uh, too late. So how do you engage them? Uh, when you engage them uh, is uh, really key. And, you know, pardon me, I don't, I don't mean to turn this into uh, a promotion for uh, Embark, but one of the things we're doing with the PQuest platform is coming up with a different approach to uh, an assessment. I mean, they're not really mental health assessments, but they kind of are. Um, and what we're kind of doing is, is putting into a, a challenge framework. Do you have what it takes to climb Mount Everest? Do you have what it takes to spend three months in the International Space Station? Do you have what it takes to be a Navy SEAL, uh, et cetera, et cetera? So there's these experiential kinds of uh, assessments by, by what you have, what it takes, you know, between the ears. So it becomes an interesting um, uh, thing for people to do because they're interested in finding for themselves if in fact they have what it takes. And while they're doing this, and, and, and you know, these are things that are meaningful to them, um, they're finding out things uh, about themselves. And so it engages them um, for a, a, as many of these challenges as they're interested uh, in participating in. So it's an ongoing uh, engagement. And, you know, there are certain, and, and to some extent, the whole process is about surfacing red flags, surfacing issues where they then, you know, be able to find the appropriate resources to address them. So, so again, the issue is uh, engagement, uh, when you're engaging these people and for how long. Yep, and and I think that that's a good point, and and uh, also Charles, you, you did make a point earlier about um, the engagement and when the patient actually gets into the system. So I will make a plug for Rose here too as well. <laughs> um, uh, the way Fair that enough. Rose works is so the way that Rose works is that we serve risk bearing entities. So we're going after ACOs, health, system and, health systems and payers. So what we do with this deep tech approach is that when we close a, a contract, we have an API plugin that we would be able to look at over 500 different parameters to identify patients who are at risk. So we look at things like diagnosis, medication, uh, clinical notes, uh, health and wellness visit results, PHQ-9, GAD-7 results. Uh, and, and then we are able to, act, to to collect a list of patients who are at risk or who we predict to be at risk of mental health. And then we would go ahead and we would mass invite them to download the platform. And that's where we're seeing about 60 to 70% of, of the patients download the platform and then they start using it. So in a case like this, we are already handling that, that early detection piece and getting them into the system without them having to go to the doctor and tell them yeah. that there's an issue. We also, for, for the, we, we have a concierge program as well for, the, for specifically for lawyers and, and kind of those that are well-paying positions, for example, um, that we offer a concierge care. So we are we can get the patient care within 30 seconds at most. Um, but the main idea here is just that we have the ability to predict, predict early. And then also we, with, with our clinical team, we can also do remote patient monitoring. So in the event of a red alert or red trigger, we can actually identify that patient and then we will call that patient immediately 24-7, 365 to be able to um, reduce that decompensation. And where we're seeing, and last statement here, where we're seeing that it's so helpful is really for 
uh, health systems as well as health plans because we can actually, we, there's now a solution that a patient can access 24 7, 365. So instead of going to the urgent care, instead of going to the emergency room, they can call Rose and Rose would be able to calm them down, help them through the, through the crisis that they're going through. And then tomorrow they'll go to the PCP. And that's how we're able to have a combination of improved outcomes and lowering costs. Well, I think that's very interesting, that approach in the sense that uh, what it really emphasizes is that there are very many people out there who go through early stages of, of some form of symptomatology. And with the system, as you just described, Kavi, there is a way clearly of picking up um, on these different things uh, by having the wealth of the data and the analytical kind of skills that such system can really bring um, in order to help people really to put the finger on, on, on sore points, whatever. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're all in precarious uh, stages of, of mental health development, um, really needing the emergency room or, um, well, uh, high level psychiatric interventions. There are very, very many people out there who have early stage developments and, and, and particular needs that are not really addressed appropriately in due time and then get worse and become maybe more significant issues. And that's the great advantage of these technological kind of approaches yeah. uh, that really do provide um, well frameworks within which such things can be um, well, um, um, well detected and, 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 yeah. and treated actually um, um, at an early stage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kavi, uh, could you address a little bit about the, the data aspect like now? So where do you get the, uh, the data from or, you know, uh, how much of it is like, you know, uh, is it like, uh, you know, you can trust the data, that aspect, you know? So obviously if you have like very rich data, you can trust it, so. Okay. Yeah, sure. So one of the core competencies, well, actually, the, we have two core competencies at Rose. One is the our algorithms that can detect depression symptoms, and the other is on, on the our clinical expertise. So we are rooted within Hopkins, and do, by doing so, we have an evidence-based approach. Um, when we look at the data and the NLP system that we've built, we've trained about 600,000 or more mental health tech samples. And we've and those were all vetted by Rose clinical experts. We were able to differentiate mood variations from depression and anxiety sentiments with about a 95% accuracy with an F1 score of, 90, of, 90, of 95%. Um, additionally, as we get into more of the data pieces and more of what we're able to use for these algorithms, we are implementing digital biomarking, digital biomarkers for behavioral risk prediction. So being able to have a flagging system that can be enhanced with heart rate, sleep, physical activity metrics from your Apple, Fitbit, and your Samsung Gear watches. And then also even building out a suicide risk identification algorithm where we're able to integrate the PHQ-9 with the natural language processing system and testing it at a, and, and yielding an 80% accuracy, accuracy rate on that PHQ-9 and a 98% accuracy, accuracy rate on that NLP. Um, when we talk about the data and what, what else is out there, we are currently using natural language processing on patients' journal entries. Um, it allows us to pick up semantic tones. And, and by doing so, we get a good understanding of whether they're having family issues, relationship issues, or health issues. And in the pipeline, we're looking at creating a dynamic ROSE score for contextual care planning, um, being able to have a naturalistic behavioral monitoring for in uh, by using audio and video cues, being able to have a feature for preclinical risk det detection from speech and voice recognition models, and also, lastly, and more probably most importantly, 
um, being able to look at social, socially environmental detriments and integrate them for behavioral health integration planning. All right. Hey, Ganesh, uh, are there uh, some uh, good questions, please? Can we take a couple of questions from the audience? Yeah, actually, there is one, uh, the recent question I have, I'm seeing here over, over here. And the question is like, as a sport uh, psychologist, how do you identify and leverage the mental health of young athletes? Do you have any apps for that? Constantine, you want to take that? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> there, is something, there is something in the observation of people, for sure. Um, I mean, you know people potentially in their natural environment. When you were a sports psychologist, you work with teams of people. Uh, you know the participants of the team, whatever else. Um, that's what we very often recommend when we work with the workplace, um, that, that the people who have line manage, managerial uh, responsibilities, knowing the members of that team, um, any variations that they can observe in the behavior and the attitudes and the way they articulate themselves, whatever else, that there are many different cues hmm, uh, that's, uh, that one can observe hmm, um, and any, any well, significance variations that come about at that level. Um, should be triggers for potentially engaging more conversation in order to explore the status of, well, how is that person feeling? How is he doing? And what Kavi is showing us is basically um, there are also technological means of doing particularly kind of the same. Uh, but um, I wouldn't go to the point of saying, well, the best way for, for you sports psychologists is to have all your people in your team, uh, first of all, taking such a test and going, going to such a system and then mm -hmm. see what comes out of it. Um, let's be natural and also do some normal observation um, of the people that you work and deal with and see what you can learn from it. Um, and we translate that now into the workplace, which is where, where we work mostly in our, in our sort of uh, professional expertise. Um, uh, we educate actually line management, uh, middle level management um, very often in exactly such behavioral techniques of how, how do you observe people? What, what, what can you detect? How do you address such things? Um, how do you talk to an individual where you have maybe questions or, or some doubt about well, how well that person is actually doing? Um, some of it relates back to, well, professional functionalities, efficiency of performing, whatever that can be indicators, but it's very often also in, well, in the more attitudinal thing, uh, how much somebody becomes more quiet, is less outspoken, or to the contrary, maybe has uh, bouches of, of strong emotions suddenly, outbursts of temper and whatever, all, all those things can be indicators of all kinds. Um, so there yeah, is a way of observation indeed to have. Yeah, because I, I can just add a little bit more to that based on um, what we're, we're seeing. We have developed a child and adolescent version of Rose. We've actually had to retool it about 80% in order to get that adolescent platform because we understand that children and adolescents are not just small adults. It's a completely different demographic. So we've had to make the platform be more of an engaging platform of larger letters, for example, more colors, more, um, more integrations with TikTok, for example, because that's kind of the craze right now, being able to, um, to record a, a journal entry versus having to type it being able to do all of these things in order to, uh, to, to keep up with the, with the adolescents and with, with the, the, the children themselves to be able to actually get some sort of treatment or at least the knowledge to build mental health resiliency, build coping mechanisms and identify triggers. And one of the main things too of why we had to retool it is that we had to change the actual um, content that we deliver to adults. We had to change the, change the formatting, You're pretty much using a, 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 the same material, but change the formatting so it looks more brighter, it looks a little bit more edgy for the adolescent population. And we've been seeing a lot of success there. On the sports side, we are working with an organization a um, very large organization that uh, that that works with 
um, sports uh, children who are who are, are almost Olympic bound um, and being able to help them with assessing their mental health and offering a solution that once they're injured, having uh, rows be a solution that is that it goes with their medication and their treatment plan so that they can continue to get back on the field as early as possible so that they can continue their mark and their trend of, of uh, being Olympic bound. Right. This has been great. Uh, Charles, do you have any uh, final thoughts about like, you know, uh, what are the challenges? What is the future? What is, uh, you know, what are we going to see coming up? Well, uh, you know, I just think it's a very exciting uh, time. Um, you know, the work that uh, Kavi and uh, Rose, what they're doing, uh, obviously, uh, what organizations and vendors are doing with uh, AI, uh, machine learning, you know, predictive uh, analytics. Um, you know, these things are going to uh, be game changers. Uh, I hate to use that uh, cliche, but uh, it's, it, it's very much the case. But I think ultimately, you know, um, the through line with the three of us um, is, even when we talk about technology, it always is connected to the human element because uh, mental health, behavioral health is fundamentally a human enterprise uh, premised on that kind of human uh, interaction. Um, you know, the technology will evolve and, you know, the technology, you know, is allowing uh, expertise to be scaled uh, and uh, so on and so forth, but that expertise is always going to be uh, very necessary. Right. Yep. Ganesh, uh, over to you. Like, uh... Thank you so much, Prashant. I see. So, uh, so I see we have already uh, there. Are, I, I guess there are a lot of lot many takeaways from this session. Okay, around the mental wellness and uh, the answers uh, you have provided to the questions. Okay, I received thank you notes for that as as well. So thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for putting time to answer those queries as well. So in a quick, uh, I would love to thank all the uh, panelists over here and just put a, a little bit uh, flashlight on the Harbinger as a group, okay, who, has the, who arranged the uh, webinar for today. So we are a 30-year-old organization. We established in 1990. So, and uh, we have... Uh, customers uh, throughout the globe. So, and being uh, uh, US and India are offices, okay? All the deliveries and activities happen from Pune in India. Uh, we have Prashant sitting in the US in Philadelphia and other management people, okay, senior guys, uh, based out of US as well, okay? Uh, we definitely provide onshore and offshore as the uh, services, okay? Uh, and. Uh, our core is uh, product engineering, where we help our uh, customers on end-to-end -end software development and related uh, activities to it. Okay. Uh, our prime customer or our domain, I would say that is health tech, uh, HR business and education domain. Uh, Harbinger Group has the, the system companies like Harbinger Systems, Harbinger Knowledge Products and Harbinger Interactive. Okay. So these two entities are into the education and uh, learning domains. So it was great to have you all guys over here. Okay. And uh, if all the attendees and panelists, if you have any questions, you can definitely write us on hsinfo at harbingergroup.com or you can even get in touch with Prashant. Okay, I've already put up the LinkedIn uh, links for all of us in the chat section so that even attendees can reach out to you guys and they can ask questions individually too. Thank you so much, everyone.